Okay, hi everyone and welcome to today's adult MDS chapter event brought to you by the Health Tree Community for MDS program. My name is Mary Arnett. I am the Health Tree for MDS Community and Education Manager. I'm very grateful and very excited to have everyone here today for this meeting and for all of the support in building our adult MDS community. I would like to let you all know that today's session is going to be recorded and the recording along with the slides and any resources we are shown today uh, will be sent via email to all of our registrants within 48 hours of the event concluding. Uh, we're going to start with a brief Zoom meeting tutorial for anyone who is new to the platform. We would love for everyone to have on your cameras if you feel comfortable. Uh, do we believe that doing that helps us to have a stronger sense of community? Uh, but of course, if you are not comfortable having your camera on and being recorded, there is no requirement to have that on. We're going to have microphones uh, off and they're going to be remain off until the end portion when we have our discussion session. And then if you would like to do your question verbally, you can unmute yourself at that point. As you can see here on this slide, this will help you learn how to turn that camera on. At the bottom of your screen, you should see the microphone and camera buttons. You can click the video icon that says to start video uh, if you would like to turn your camera on. If you have any questions or comments for us or for our speaker throughout the presentation, you can click on the chat icon and type them into the chat box. If you're using a mobile device or a tablet, you'll want to click the three dot icon that says more and then chat in order to use that chat box. And lastly, if you want to verbally ask a question or make a comment directly to our speaker during the discussion time at the end, we encourage you to do so. If you're using a laptop or a desktop, you'll click reactions near the bottom of the screen, uh, and then you'll click to raise your hand. If you're using a mobile device or a tablet, you can click on the three horizontal dots that say more and then click that raise your hand button. So now we're gonna get started with today's event. First, we'd like to thank our sponsors who make events like this possible. Uh, those sponsors are Bristol Myers Squibb and AbbVie. Now, the topic of today's event is defining and treating or not treating lower risk MDS. Here is our agenda for today. I'm going to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sacris, and then he will spend the next 30 minutes or so giving us his presentation. After that presentation, we'll open it up for questions and comments. So I'm going to take a second to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sacris. Dr. Sacris joined the University of Miami Health System and Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center as the chief of the Division of Hematology. His research focuses on patients with MDS and older adults with acute myeloid leukemia, AML. He has been the national and international primary study investigator on dozens of, of phase one, two, and three clinical trials. Uh, you can see he has quite an impressive uh, resume with the being the author, co-author of over 400 manuscripts and 600 meeting abstracts. He's a frequent essayist for the New York Times and has written eight books. He's on the executive committee of the American Society of Hematology and a member of the American Society of Clinical Oncology and the Southwestern Oncology Group Leukemia Committee. I'm sure you can see why we are really excited to have him on for this event today um, and to talk to us a little bit about low risk MDS and some of the decision making that goes on there. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the presentation time over to him. Great, thank you so much for the lovely introduction, Mary. I only wish my um, mother had been listening uh, to uh, hear all of these nice things that you had to say. <laughs> so I am gonna talk about defining and treating or not treating lower risk myelodysplastic syndromes because we don't always have to treat it. So let's start off with a brief definition. What are myelodysplastic syndromes? Well. They're defined as a heterogeneous collection of clonal hematopoietic disorders derived from an abnormal multipotent progenitor cell characterized by a hyperproliferative bone marrow, dysplasia of the cellular elements, and ineffective hematopoiesis. Now, my dad, who was a journalist, would have taken me out to the woodshed for trying to give a definition that is as convoluted as this. But this is the definition that we often find in textbooks. And that's really why I think a lot of not only patients, but doctors don't really understand myelodysplastic syndromes. I don't understand it from this definition. So let me put it in really simple terms. MDS is a type of cancer, and cancer is a scary word. There are some cancers where 
you know, we really worry about them and we really rush to, to treatment because if we don't, the cancers could cause significant harm in people. But then there are cancers that we really consider to be more like chronic diseases, like a, getting a diagnosis of diabetes that we don't rush to treatment. And myelin dysplastic syndromes is a huge range of those cancers from those that really aren't immediately life-threatening to those that are potentially very, very serious. We're focusing on lower risk myelodysplastic syndromes and we'll define that. And those are more of a chronic type of cancer. So any cancer starts with a, a mutation, an abnormality that occurs in a cell that gives that cell a growth advantage compared to other cells around it. If that happens in the breast, you, you get a lump. Those cells are outgrowing other cells around them. If it happens in the lungs, you get a mass. If it happens in the bone marrow, you get a bone marrow that fills up with abnormal cells. And as that bone marrow fills with abnormal cells, the normal cells in the bone marrow die off. Since it's the bone marrow's job to make the red blood cells that bring oxygen to our tissues, the white blood cells that help fight infections, and the platelets that help stop bleeding, if those normal cells die out, a person winds up having low blood counts. They're anemic, they have a low platelet count, and they may have a low white blood cell count. So that's what we mean by this crazy definition. Mutations occur in cells that cause them to grow a lot. They take over the bone marrow space. So, so it's a hyper proliferative bone marrow, but they're abnormal cells. That's what, we, that's what dysplasia is. Dysplasia means bad growing. So myelodysplasia are bad growing myeloid cells. And as a result, people have fewer blood cells in their bloodstream. So what does this look like on a, on a genetic basis? Well, this is what I talked about earlier about a mutation in a cell. If you look in the center of the screen towards the left in the white portion of the slide, you'll see a little purple circle in the, in the larger gray circle. The gray circle is a cell. The purple circle is a mutation. That mutation then leads to other mutations in the green portion. That's when we say people have a, a diagnosis that we've actually just developed in the past decade called clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential or CHIP. As they acquire more mutations, they then progress to myelodysplastic syndromes. So one important thing to remember about myelodysplastic syndromes is that when you have one of these mutations in a cell that causes it to outgrow other cells around it, I'm oversimplifying it. It's not just one mutation. People with MDS often have an average of four mutations that are significant. They may have over nine or 10 mutations in total that lead to the development of MDS. So it's not one thing that goes wrong, it's multiple things that go on that lead to the myelodysplastic syndrome. If those mutations continue to happen, then myelodysplastic syndromes can evolve into acute myeloid leukemia or AML. That is much more common in people who have higher risk MDS than lower risk MDS. So I made this distinction about lower and higher risk MDS. What do I mean by this? Well, the World Health Organization is one standard for how we define myelodysplastic syndromes, and they do it in kind of a funny way, which also is confusing about MDS. They, they start off with, does the MDS have a specific genetic mutation that we can identify? And some of the more common mutations are people who have an abnormality of chromosome five called a deletion 5Q, those who have what's called an SF3B1 mutation, or those who have a TP53 mutation. And I've drawn red arrows where I would consider it to be higher risk MDS as opposed to lower risk MDS. The red arrows are also next to patients who have increased blasts. Blasts are immature white blood cells. We all have blasts in our bone marrow. So I may have 1% blasts in my bone marrow right now because you need an immature white blood cell, a blast, to eventually make a mature white blood cell and to make a mature immune system. Once somebody has 5% blasts or more, we say that that's abnormal. Once somebody has 20% blasts, we would say that they have acute myeloid leukemia. So you can see how looking in the bone marrow, you can, you can very clearly determine when somebody has myelodysplastic syndrome, if he or she has anywhere from 1% to 19% blasts, and then once those blasts move on to 20% or higher, we would say that the myelodysplastic syndrome has flipped into acute myeloid leukemia. 
Other lower risk subtypes of MDS are, are of course those who have low blasts with their MDS or those who have what's called a hypoplastic MDS. That's a rare subtype of MDS where for whatever reason, instead of filling up with cells, the bone marrow looks like a barren desert. It actually doesn't have a lot of cells in it. Now, as if that weren't confusing enough, the very same month that the World Health Organization released a classification of MDS, another group released a different classification for MDS. And this is why people get so confused by this disease. It's, it, it's our own fault. We, we've tried to make it more complicated to define different subgroups in all of this. So you may go to a doctor and the doctor may give you a classification according to the World Health Organization, or you might go to a doctor and they do it instead by the international consensus classification. This again identifies patients who have those genetic mutations, SF3B1, deletion 5Q, but then what it does is identifies patients who have MDS with what's called single lineage dysplasia. Some people who have MDS have only anemia or only a low platelet count or only a low white blood cell count. On the other hand, there are some patients who have MDS with two blood counts or three blood counts that are abnormal. Those have multi-lineage dysplasia. Again, once patients have excess blasts at the bottom of the screen where the red arrow is, we would say they have higher risk MDS Another thing that the ICC did, which is very confusing, is identified an overlap term of patients who have myelodysplastic syndrome and acute myeloid leukemia when they have between 10 and 19% blasts. This has not gotten wide acceptance in the MDS community. And as I explained earlier, somebody who has, for example, 17% blasts, making a distinction between that person at 17% blast and somebody who has 20% blast, where we would call them acute leukemia, is really kind of silly. They're, they're very similar to each other. So while I appreciate the fact that the ICC did say with patients who have 10 to 19% blast, gee, they're getting pretty close to AML, it, it actually kind of makes it more confusing to all of us. So if you're, if you're trying to keep this straight, less than 20% blast is MDS, 20% or more blast is considered acute myeloid leukemia. Why is this so important? Why am I spending five minutes on the diagnosis of MDS? The reason I am is because the diagnosis is tricky and it's even tricky for pathologists. This was a study we conducted through the National Institutes of Health where we actually recruited people to a study when they had a suspected MDS diagnosis. So someone may have a low blood count, their doctor sent them for a bone marrow biopsy and it was at that moment that we enrolled in this, to this study. Their local pathologist, let's say somebody was enrolled into the trial and they lived in Nebraska, their Nebraska pathologist made a diagnosis. And then we received the same specimen from the bone marrow at our central location. And our pathologists who are experts at MDS also looked at that diagnosis. And guess what? About 20% of the time they disagreed. The local pathologist may have said that somebody had MDS or a central pathologist may have said, no, they don't. They've got a vitamin deficiency or the opposite. So one out of five times there's discrepancy in the diagnosis. That's high enough that you owe it to yourself if you have a diagnosis of MDS to make sure you get a second opinion, not only on your own treatment, but also on the diagnosis itself just to make sure. Now, one of the most common questions my patients ask me is what stage am I? If, if MDS is a cancer, what stage cancer do I have? Well, we don't stage MDS. And the reason is that it occurs in the blood and bone marrow. So if we were to stage it, it would be a little silly. We would say, okay, everyone has stage four. And clearly not everybody has an advanced version of MDS. So instead we quote unquote stage it based on some risk factors. We do that based on the genetics of the MDS. That blast percentage that I keep, keep talking about, that's so important. And then the number and degrees of low blood counts. So low hemoglobin, low platelets, and a low neutrophil count. Neutrophils are a subtype of white blood cells. And then we generate a score. And you can see there are some people who have a very low score, one and a half or lower, who have an average survival that approaches a decade. That's very low risk MDS. And that's, that's where you can understand that I would call it a chronic cancer. On the other hand, there are people who have a very high risk MDS. Let's say they have very poor genetics, high blast percentage, and multiple 
cell lines are affected are low, those folks have an average survival that's less than a year. It's those folks that we intervene on very quickly, whereas people who have lower risk MDS, we don't necessarily have to offer a treatment quickly or offer a treatment at all. That cut point for lower versus higher risk MDS using the revised IPSS International Prognostic Scoring System, that's our staging system, is three and a half. So people who have a score that's three and a half or lower, we would say have lower risk MDS. Those who have a score that's over three and a half, we would say have higher risk MDS. But MDS is even more complicated than that. So we also look at mutations, those genetic mutations at a very low level. And we've identified about 100 genetic mutations that we now associate with myelodysplastic syndromes. So we test for them, and they all have these silly nomenclatures where they're a combination of letters and numbers. We can make it very easy, though. The good risk mutation, the one that, that you, know, you want to have, is the SF3B1 mutation. That's the one way at the bottom that's in blue. That's a good risk mutation. All of the others really don't affect risk very much, or they may adversely affect risk. They may be poor risk mutations recognizing that there's this whole other collection of data that we have that affect how we think about prognosis and risk in MDS, there's a, a new version of the International Prognostic Scoring System that you, actually you enter data online. And you can do this yourself. It's publicly available. If you Google IPSSM for International Prognostic Scoring System Molecular, you'll get to a website on the MDS Foundation and you can actually enter data about yourself. And that's data about your blood counts, about your age, about your bone marrow biopsy. So it's important to get that bone marrow biopsy report and about those genetics. And it will produce a score that is very accurate for predicted survival and predicted um, risk that the MDS will go into leukemia. Now, remember, when you do this, this is based on a population of patients, so it may or may not apply to an individual, but it kind of gives you a sense of whether we would think about this as a lower risk MDS or a higher risk MDS and the urgency to pursue treatment. Okay, so let's talk about an individual patient. 72-year-old woman comes to my clinic with worsening fatigue, and she tells me it feels like my legs are encased in cement. And I actually had a patient say this to me once because she was profoundly anemic. She now uses a handicap parking tag to park close to the casino entrance when she goes gambling. Her past medical history is notable for high blood pressure, heart disease, and she's a smoker. And if you're worrying that I'm violating somebody's, somebody, one of my patient's privacy by showing this photo, it's actually a, a photo of my mom. My mom does not have myelodysplastic syndromes, um, although she, she actually has had a diagnosis of cancer. Uh, this person's blood counts, uh, the white blood cell count is normal, although the neutrophil count is low. Remember the neutrophils, the ANC, is a subtype of the white blood cells. The neutrophils fight bacterial infections. She's anemic, her hemoglobin, we, met, we, we refer to the amount of red blood cells by the hemoglobin is 7.8. That's about, about one third lower than it should be. Her platelet count is normal at 174,000. And a bone marrow biopsy shows that she has too many cells in her bone marrow. Remember, MDS is a, is a cancer, so it causes a hypercellular bone marrow. She has abnormal cells that make red blood cells. That's called dyserythropoiesis and they're associated with ring sideroblasts. Ring sideroblasts, um, if you imagine the bone marrow sample, the pathologist added dye to those cells and the dye is taken up in this beautiful ring, almost like Saturn, um, around some of the cells. That's called a ring sideroblast. Those are important for a couple of reasons. First of all, they are associated with the SF3B1 mutation. That's the good one. And there's a specific drug that's been approved by the FDA for people who have ring sideroblasts. Her genetics are normal, but she does have that SF3B1 mutation. So this is how we use the IPSSR. We, we, we add a score to it based on the number, uh, based on the blood counts and how low they are, based on the genetics and based on the blast percentage. So her score would be 2.5. We would say, say she has lower risk MDS. We also can score this by the IPSSM, and her score for the IPSM would also put her into a low-risk category. 
This is literally how we use these systems to do essentially staging of MDS. How do we treat it? Well, we treat MDS based on the predominating low blood count when a patient walks into our office. So if you look at the left of the screen, you may have, you yourself may have no transfusion needs with your MDS and a good quality of life. That's wonderful. One of my patients once referred to that as having mild displeasure syndrome. And it, for him, it was. He didn't like to have to fight the traffic to drive into Miami to see me. But other than that, it didn't really affect his life. These are the folks we don't have to treat. We observe them. I will follow my patients every few months, make sure their blood counts aren't changing, make sure they're feeling well. We shake hands. I see them in another few months without a drop of therapy. On the other hand, I have some patients who come into my office and they have anemia. I have some patients who walk into my office, they have what's called thrombocytopenia, that's a low platelet count. And I have some patients who walk into my office and they have multiple cytopenias. So they might have anemia and a low platelet count or anemia and a low white blood cell count. And this is how we determine what therapies we give to somebody with lower risk MDS. So that first category, like I mentioned, no transfusion needs, good quality of life, it's fabulous. The only thing I'm going to add to that person if I give them treatment are side effects of therapy. We do not allow somebody to live longer or to live better by starting therapy early when they have lower risk MDS. So in this person, I don't do a darn thing. I just let them go. Why is that? Well, I like to think about lower risk MDS the way my patients might think about it and the time that they have to invest into getting treated. I think about the time my patient wakes up, gets dressed, gets into a car, has to drive to the cancer center, has to park the car, has to walk to the laboratory to have blood drawn, has to wait to see me, wait for the doctor's appointment, sees me, then has to wait for an appointment in our infusion center if that person's getting an intravenous drug, then has to wait in one of the chairs in the infusion center, then receives the infusion, then walks back to their car, then has to drive home. So whenever I think about a treatment for one of my patients who has lower risk MDS, I ask the question, is it worth it? Is it worth all of this time, effort, and money that somebody has to expend to come and see me to get a treatment for me to prescribe that treatment. So let's focus on folks who have anemia. Um, and a lot of these folks start to have to require blood transfusions. And these are people in whom we start either an erythropoiesis stimulating agent or the drug loose patercept. And let me explain what I mean by that. Erythropoiesis stimulating agents are hormones. The most common ones are erythropoietin, so commonly called epigen or procrit, or darbopoietin, often called an aranesp. These are hormones that we give to folks. They're not chemotherapy, but they stimulate the remaining normal bone marrow cells to make more red blood cells. When we give this to our patients, the chance that they're going to work is somewhere in the range of 15 to 40%. There was a study that we did a little over a decade ago that showed that over 20 years of research in this, the, these drugs work about 40% of the time. There was another study that was conducted in Europe that at first showed that they only worked 15% of the time, but then when they followed patients for a longer period of time, they wound up working 35% of the time. So that's why I give this range. They work about 15 to 40% of the time to improve the red blood cells, improve that hemoglobin, and even eliminate the need for red blood cell transfusions in patients. Now, Luzpatercept was recently approved by the FDA. This is a study that we conducted and published in 2020. It was, it was, Luzpatercept was approved soon afterwards for patients who have those ring sideroblasts or that SF3B1 mutation and who had already been treated with one of those erythropoiesis stimulating agents, either the Procrit or the Aranesp. In those patients, Luzpatercept worked 38% of the time. And on average, it worked for about 32 weeks, so about 10 months out of the year. One of the things I always point out with the loose powder step study, though, if you look at the right-hand portion of the slide, every red dot you see is a blood transfusion that patients received, and the length of that blue line is how long somebody went get without needing a transfusion on the loose powder step. And what you see is that some of those red dots interrupt 
those blue lines. In other words, someone might have gotten gone for a period of time, let's say 10 weeks without needing a transfusion, then needed one bag of blood, but then may have gone another year or two without needing a transfusion. So in starting loose powder sept, it's given every three weeks. I wouldn't worry that it failed if a person gets one bag of blood. I would keep giving it and see if it continues to work even beyond that bag of blood. The other thing about loose powder sept is that the dose can be increased a couple of times. So we start at one dose, you can increase it once more and then once more after that. Now, loose powder sept recently, just a few weeks ago, has been approved by the FDA up front so that people don't have to have been exposed to an erythropoiesis stimulating agent. They can get it right out of the gate if they have anemia with their myelodysplastic syndrome. In this study, it worked 58% of the time compared to the, those erythropoiesis stimulating agents working 31% of the time. But there's a big caveat to that, and that is that if you focus just on patients who have ring sideroblasts, gee whiz, they really did seem to benefit from the loose powder set compared to those who got the erythropoiesis stimulating agents. But if patients didn't have ring sideroblasts, the drug didn't seem to work any better than erythropoiesis stimulating agents. So if you have MDS with ring sideroblast, you can choose. You can start with an erythropoiesis stimulating agent and then go to loose powder sept, or you can use loose powder sept right out of the gates. If you don't, if you have MDS, but it doesn't have ring sideroblasts, then there doesn't appear to be much benefit to starting the loose powder sept right out of the gates. And this is the duration of response for patients on this study. Those who got loose powder sept seem to actually do, do well with it for a couple of years. Okay, so what if instead you have a myelodysplastic syndrome that has that deletion 5Q abnormality, that abnormality of chromosome 5? Well, the drug lenalidomide, that's the generic name, the, the brand name is Revlimid, was looked at in a bunch of studies about a decade ago, and specifically in people who have this abnormality and who already were requiring red blood cell transfusions, 61% of those folks no longer needed those blood transfusions when they started the lenalidomide, the Revlimid. That is a really good response rate. That, that, that's an incredible benefit in people who have lower risk MDS if almost two thirds benefit from the drug and benefit substantively, meaning that they previously needed red blood cell transfusions and then didn't after they started this pill. And the duration of response was over two years. So these folks went an average of over two years without needing a blood transfusion. I've personally treated folks with this drug where they've gone four or five years and counting without needing a blood transfusion. So this is a, a really great drug for those who have that very specific deletion 5Q abnormality with their MDS, their abnormality of chromosome 5. Now this drug was also explored in people who don't have that deletion 5Q MDS, who also are dependent on red blood cell transfusions. And in this study, it didn't work quite as well. It worked about 25% of the time. So one out of four people benefited from this drug, whereas before it was almost two thirds of the time that it, that it worked in patients who had the deletion 5Q abnormality. The duration of time it worked also was much more modest at 33 weeks. Remember, in those who had the deletion 5Q, it worked for over two years on average. For these folks, it was more like about 10 months. So I do think that the lenalidomide, the Revlimid, is an option for people who don't have deletion 5Q MDS. It's an off-label use, so the FDA has not approved it for this specific indication, and it doesn't work quite as well. Okay, what if you have lower risk myelodysplastic syndrome and you have a low platelet count? Well, then we have drugs that are kind of similar to that, those hormones that we talked about before, those erythropoiesis stimulating agents for people who have low red blood cells, except these are for low platelet counts. Now, there are two drugs that are on the market. Again, these are off-label uses for these drugs. So the FDA has not approved their use for myelodysplastic syndrome with low platelet count, but you can usually get it paid for because we have these studies supporting its use. In this study, patients with a low platelet count who got this drug, l which also known as Promacta, about 40% of them had an improvement in their platelet count over time. 
The other drug is called Ramipostem. The brand name is N-Plate. Again, this is off-label use. In another study, those who got the Ramipostem were significantly more likely to have fewer bleeding events and fewer platelet transfusions. So this seemed like this drug was a home run. But there's a big caveat to both of these studies, and that is that if your MDS has excess blasts, if your MDS has 5% blasts or more, we never, never, never give these drugs. And the reason is that these drugs can stimulate those blasts to grow. And on this study, on the Ramiplostem study, there were patients who were enrolled to this study who had excess blasts, and sure enough, their blasts grew enough that some of them transformed into acute myeloid leukemia. This study was therefore closed early because of this higher rate of acute myeloid leukemia. Over time, the rates of acute myeloid leukemia evened out between those who got the ramiplastin, the end plate, and those who got placebo. But that's the reason these drugs will never get approved for MDS. That it, they're just too tricky in those who have excess blasts. So if you have lower risk MDS, but don't have excess blasts, these drugs are a consideration if you have a low platelet count. But if you have lower risk MDS and do have excess blasts, then these drugs are not an option. They're too dangerous. Now, what about people who have multiple blood counts that are abnormal? Well, in these folks, I think the standard of care are what are called hypomethylating agents. We have three of them on the market, D-cytidine or dacogen, azacytidine or videza, and then there's a combination D-cytidine cetazuridine, which is a pill also known as Encovi. In this study, we actually gave less of the decitabine and the azacytidine, the dacogen and the videza, than the label recommends. Instead of giving five days of the decitabine, we gave three. And instead of giving seven days of the azacytidine, we gave three because the patients we enrolled to this study had lower risk MDS. I frequently will give seven days of azacytidine for my patients with higher risk MDS, but I've always thought that's too much for my patients with lower risk MDS. So we actually studied it and gave these drugs for three days every 28 days. We enrolled 113 patients onto this study. And what we found is that the drugs worked about 54% of the time. That was about 20% higher than has been seen previously. So it turns out that less is more. Giving only three days of the decitabine or three days of the azacytidine worked better than giving five or seven days of these drugs. And um, the patients who required blood transfusions prior to starting the study, about one third of them no longer require blood transfusions. So I wanna, those are kind of the overview of our standard drugs for lower risk MDS and how we think about treating or not treating lower risk MDS. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions about this. Thanks so much for listening today. Okay. Let me share my screen again. Okay, so now, thank you so much for that presentation. That was so, I learned so much from that. Um, and I hope those in our community here did as well. So now we'll have time to take any questions. So like we showed before, if you wanted to do a question in the chat, you can go ahead and click on that chat icon at the bottom and then type it in. Or if you are on a mobile device, you can click the... Um, three dots and then the chat, or if you would like to rate, do your question verbally, you can raise your hand and then we will make sure that we get, that we call on you to ask your question. Uh, so it looks like we have one question. Uh, Katie says, how do I know the bone marrow biopsy results I'm getting are going to be accurate? Is there a certain type of pathologist I should be asking for? Yeah, that's a great question, um, Katie. And that kind of gets to the, the meat of that study that we did through the National Institutes of Health, where we compared the accuracy of diagnoses from one pathologist to another. And I, I felt so strongly about this. I actually wrote an editorial that was in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago about the importance of getting a second opinion on this. 
So um, the first thing I would do is ask for a printout of your bone marrow biopsy. And you can either get a printout or a lot of us, myself included, are enrolled on into our electronic medical records so we can see our test results ourselves. Then what I would do is make sure that you're at an MDS specialty center. One of the, you saw how I spent a lot of time at the beginning of my presentation talking about how tricky it is to make the diagnosis of MDS and how confusing it is. Well, imagine that you're a pathologist who's practicing in a general hematology or general cancer clinic. Most of the patients you're going to see, most of the specimens that you're going to see are going to be from people who have breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, or prostate cancer. Why? Because those are the most common cancers. You're going to see really very few samples from people who have myelodysplastic syndromes. As a result, you're just simply not going to be as good at reading bone marrows from people who have myelodysplastic syndromes. So what I urge people to do is to go and see an MDS specialist, and there are a bunch of centers of excellence for MDS around the country. You can even contact the Aplastic Anemia and MDS Foundation, where I'm, I'm actually um, chair of the medical advisory board for them. They will direct you to good people who are closer to home and insist that your bone marrow specimen also be evaluated at that specialty center because they are far more likely to have pathologists who are experts at looking at MDS bone marrow samples. Thank you for that answer. Uh, we have another question. Uh, when do you start treating anemia? What kinds of symptoms should I be watching for that might mean I need to start treatment? Yeah, that's a, another great question. Um, so I have kind of a rough, you know, back of the envelope way of, of calculating this. Um, most people don't have any symptoms from anemia if their hemoglobin is greater than 10. So it's very rare with the hemoglobin greater than 10 that you're really going to run into any problems. And it may be something else that is related to symptoms. So what do we mean by symptoms of anemia? Uh, a lot of my patients tell me that they feel tired. They get short of breath, particularly if they're walking up an incline or climbing stairs. They may have less of an appetite than they, than they did before. Um, occasionally, my patients will say that they get headaches, but you can hear how nonspecific these symptoms are. Someone who, the, the average age of diagnosis of myelodysplastic syndrome is about 71 years old. So imagine somebody coming into my clinic at age 80 who says, you know, I've been more tired um, and I don't have the stamina that I used to. Those are kind of broad symptoms. They're hard to tie down to one specific diagnosis. It could be related to myelodysplastic syndrome and, and anemia, or it might be related to somebody who has heart disease, right? Could be either one, or maybe somebody who has COPD. So our first job is to identify whether the symptoms are truly related to anemia or not. In general, as I mentioned, hemoglobin greater than 10, extraordinarily rare to have symptoms from anemia. Uh, hemoglobin in the nines, also kind of unusual. My patients start to tend to feel it in the eights and definitely feel it with a hemoglobin in the sevens. So for my patients, I don't start thinking about transfusions until they get into a hemoglobin that's you know, less than eight and a half or even less than eight, that's when I would start to treat it. And then my back of the envelope calculation that I mentioned earlier is how frequently does one of my patients getting a transfusion mean that that transfusion is so impacting his or her quality of life that I should start a drug to combat the anemia. And roughly that's about once a month. So once your blood transfusions are getting to be more frequent than once a month, then I'm going to start to treat the anemia. Thank you for that answer. Uh, we have another question. Uh, it says, does someone who is low risk need to see a specialist or can they just see their community doctor after diagnosis? Yeah, I like that question a lot, right? It's, it's easy for me to say, come and see a specialist because I'm a specialist and I have to come into work in Miami every day. It's much harder for somebody who's, who lives up in West Palm and then has to drive an hour or an hour and a half during rush hour to come and see me. Um, what I would say is if you truly have a lower risk MDS, you have mild abnormalities of your blood counts, you don't need transfusions yet, um, nothing else is going on, as long as your blood counts remain fairly stable, you don't need to see a specialist. 
I think that once you start to require treatments, um, you know, uh, I think a, a, a local doc for the most part can, is, they're pretty comfortable with giving erythropoiesis stimulating agents. So Epigen, Procrit, or Aranesp. Um, but I have often seen that they don't give enough of them. They give them at too low a dose and they give up on them too soon. So you can certainly start to do that with a local doc. If it's not working, or if they say it's it's stopped working, I think that's your opportunity to go and see a specialist. Once you have higher risk MDS, um, I would definitely see a specialist. Then you're dealing with something that's that's more complicated uh, and, and I think requires specialty care. Uh, we have another question that says, I feel anxious about watch and wait. How do you help your patients who feel anxious because they know they have cancer and aren't doing anything to treat it? Yeah, another great, great question. So I try to put it in context and I'm the sort of person, if I have a medical diagnosis myself, I want to treat it and I want to get rid of it. That is just my personality. So it kind of drives me nuts to not treat something also. I totally get it. What gives me comfort in doing, in doing, using this approach with my patients is there was actually a study that was conducted and it was published in the New England Journal. So that's like our highest tier medical journal. And it was in patients who had chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And you can think of chronic lymphocytic leukemia or CLL as being very similar to myelodysplastic syndromes. It has lower risk and it has higher risk. And classically, people who had lower risk CLL weren't treated. Well, in this study, patients, it was kind of an incredible study. They were randomized to being not treated at all versus getting treatment at the very beginning of their diagnosis with CLL. And, and the, the treatment was chemotherapy. And on that study, there was no difference in how long people lived, if they got treatment early or if they, if someone waited on treatment until they absolutely needed it. Exact same approach in MDS. There's no study that has ever shown that if we intervene earlier in somebody with MDS, they're going to live longer or they're going to live better. So um, that's how I would think about it. Um, and also think about the fact that if you don't need treatment right now, you know, your MDS was probably diagnosed almost by accident. You wouldn't have been given that diagnosis for a year or two. And it just so happened that your doctor happened to send the lab tests that led to a bone marrow biopsy that led to the diagnosis. And that's something that's called um, lead time bias in when we diagnose cancers. With more screening and more testing, we're diagnosing cancers at a much earlier stage than they ever were before. And we're probably telling people they have cancer years before we would have told them before. So try to think about it all that way. If you're not getting treatment right now, that's awesome. Congratulations. Um, and it means you're avoiding the side effects of therapy and you're saving those therapies for when you absolutely need it with your MDS. Thank you for that answer. Uh, just another question that I was thinking about during your presentation. You said there are a couple different options of HMA drugs for patients now, how do you make the distinction between which ones you try for which patients? Right. So HMAs, meaning hypomethylating agents, there are three drugs that are on the market, azacitabine or Vidaza, decitabine or dacogen, or a combination of decitabine, cetazuridine, uh, which is a pill called Encovi. So the first two, azacitabine is usually given as an injection under the skin or intravenously, Dacogen, decitabine or dacogen is given intravenously, and the decitabine cetazuridine, the Encovi, is a pill. I, I will tell you, 98% uh, of the time, I use azacitidine. The reason is that the best data out there support azacitidine's use. It's the only study that's ever been conducted to show that a drug that we use to treat MDS allows people to live longer, and that was azacitidine for patients who have higher risk MDS. And I also feel as if it's really better tolerated for my patients. Decitabine seems to be a stronger formulation. I've seen much more challenges in patients getting decitabine with their blood counts dropping and them needing, actually starting to require transfusions because of side effects of the drug, not because of the MDS. And the Encovi, was only approved by the FDA. The decitabine cetazuridine pill was approved by the FDA based on the levels of the drug reached in the bloodstream, not based on how well it works or really on side effects of the drug. 
And more and more, I'm seeing patients who are started on those pills, the decidabine cetazerinine pills or the Encovi pills, and their blood counts are plummeting. And then they need delays in starting their next course of therapy. And I, I think they're kind of getting into trouble with it. I don't think that the five-day pill dosing is the right formulation, the right course. Um, and we don't quite know what the right course is yet. Uh, another question that just came in said, maybe this was discussed earlier, uh, but what markers are you watching for? Or is it certain blood tests, bone marrow tests that you're looking for to determine starting treatment? Yeah, for lower risk MDS, we're looking at the blood counts. So ordinarily, a patient of mine will have a bone marrow biopsy, we'll establish the diagnosis of MDS, we'll get the genetic tests, we'll look at their blood counts, and if they don't need treatment yet, I'm just going to follow those blood counts. If those blood counts drop, um, and blood counts can, can be a little bit different from one visit to the next, because even if you check my blood counts, if you check them right now, you check them a week from now and two weeks from now, you're going to see all sorts of different reads on my blood counts, because they kind of go like this. They, they zigzag a little bit, right? I call them saw toothing. It's like, like the uh, sharp edge of a saw. Um, so little fluctuations aren't a big deal. If your, let's say your hemoglobin starts off and it's 11.8, and I see it three months later, it's 11.7, and three months after that, it's 11.9, and three months after that, it's 11.6, and then it's 11.8. I'm not going to do anything. That's nice and stable. If I see you and your hemoglobin is 11.8, then the next time I see you, it's 11.1, and the next time I see you, it's 10.2, and then the next time I see you, it's 9.3, then it's much more of a pattern that's going to prompt me to do another bone marrow biopsy, make sure this is still lower risk MDS, and then, as I mentioned, once that hemoglobin gets into the eights, I'm going to start to think about treatment. Okay, thank you so much for all those, for all your answers, for all the questions. We have Sophie in the comments saying thank you, that it was a great presentation. I echo that. I definitely agree. Um, we are going to go ahead and looks like we are out of time. So we are going to move on. I just want to announce our next event is going to be on October 3rd from, uh, we're gonna be talking about anemia and MDS, what you need to know. Uh, Dr. Douglas Tremblay is gonna do that perform that uh, presentation for us. We're really excited about that one. And then we wanna one more time thank our sponsors. That's Bristol Myers Squibb and AbbVie. Without them, this wouldn't have been possible. And then finally, I just wanna say thank you to Dr. Sacris for his presentation, for all of our community here for joining and for being a part of this and helping us build this wonderful community. We are so grateful for these educational opportunities um, and so grateful for everyone here. We hope to see everyone at our next event on October 3rd. Uh, thank you again for coming. We're so grateful to have all of you in our community and I hope you have a great rest of your day.